it seems we've left uh, the world of fungus behind. It's here, and now we're looking at protists, which are here. So protists are all the eukaryotes that are single-celled and not fungal. They range from algae, which are basically single-celled green plants, to super weird, nightmarish, single-celled creatures. And in this phylogenetic tree that we've seen before, this is the one where we compare um, ribosomal RNA genes. Um, we see animals, uh, the fungi and the plants grouped together and all of this other stuff, these very long branches, these are um, the different protists. And remember, the long branches mean they are very different from us. You measure the length of the branch to get how different they are. And all of these protists are very different from us at a cellular level. They're super weird. So, um, again, they are single-celled eukaryotes, and their, their phylogeny is difficult to study, as I'm going to show you in the next slide. Um, they are not a single group that has a common ancestor. Um, they are a classification of everything that is not fungal, every single-celled thing that is not fungal. Um, so on the following slide, we're going to see another phylogenetic tree, and what you're going to see is I point out some of the same um, some of the same groups that are on the previous slide, but the phylogeny is different. So in particular, um, canidoplastids, parabacillids, and diplomonads, those are all, if we could back up, those are all very long, deep branches. Um, yeah, and as we'll see, um, I've pointed those out on this phylogeny, and we will compare that in a little bit. But first, let's understand what we're looking at here. This is just eukaryotes, and this was constructed using more than one gene and not the 16S ribosomal, or not ribosomal RNA. So this is a more sophisticated way to make a eukaryotic phylogeny. Um, the tree I've been showing you was basically made in the 1970s from 16S ribosomal RNA or from the eukaryotic and archaeal um, counterparts to that. So what we get from the ribosomal RNA is that plants, fungi, and animals are in one group. But what we get here... Oh, so this is a more sophisticated analysis, and it's a tree that doesn't have a root. So that's okay. So, and also the, the branch lengths aren't meaningful here. Instead, what we look at is how far the branches are from the, the edges. So for example, um, these, this line here and this line here, they, their branch point is here. So we could think of their common ancestor as being a certain far back, a certain distance back in time where this one and this one, well, they're common ancestors all the way back here. So we look at that kind of thing, but we don't measure um, the length on this kind of tree. This really is just showing us the relative locations of the branch points and the groupings. So the weirdest thing we see in this tree is that if you have the plants and the group that has the fungi and the animals, that group also has all of these in it. Um, so really all of this is one group and really this is another part of that group. Um, so this is fundamentally different from what you get from the ribosomal RNA which puts plants, fungi, and animals together and excludes all this other stuff. So canidoplastids, parabacillids, and diplomonads are all in this group that splits off from within the plants, fungi, and animals. Um, I don't necessarily, yeah, I don't expect you to memorize this. I just want you to see that the phylogeny is different depending on how you um, measure it. But also, a lot of the protists we're going to look at are from this group. So you'll see, if you, if you go back to look at um, 
look at this after you've looked at the protist pathogens, you'll see a lot of them come from this group. And then the malaria, the one that causes malaria, is over here. Um, cool. So um, that's all the protist biology that I can give you um, because they really don't have a lot in common with each other. So we are going to see a little bit about their life cycles and biology as we go through the pathogens. Um, and we're going to classify them, as clinicians do, based on their motility. So there's a group that use flagella to get around. There's a group, group that act like amoebas, a group with cilia, and then a non-motile group. So we'll look at those each one at a time. So first, let's look at the flagellar motility. And yeah, these are nasty. So um, Giardia lamblia, or Giardia intestinalis, which is its newer name, cause giardiasis. And this is a line drawing of Giardia. If you look at it under the microscope, you would see these features, sort of. And these are flagella that it moves around with. Um, this is non-invasive. They will live um, along the epithelium in the small intestine and interfere with it. So there are a um, wide variety of estimates about how common this is. Um, we know there are m hundreds of thousands of cases per year worldwide, maybe as many as um, two million. Um, in the US, it's something more like um, in the US, there's something like 10 to 15,000 cases reported every year. The actual number of cases that happen could be as high as 2 million. Um, so this could be very underreported if it's if this infections aren't severe. Um, Giardia is transmitted by the fecal oral route. That means um, it grows in the intestine and it is excreted in feces. And if that contaminates uh, water um, that you drink, then you get this um, infecting your gut. Uh, we do have treatments for it. Um, other things to know about it. Let's see, a lot of this you could read. And other things to know is that um, they will attached to the epithelial lining and prevent uh, fat absorption. So the fat that would be normally be um, uh, in droplets that get absorbed will get all the way to the colon and will be fermented by Clostridia and others. And fat fermentation leads to some of the worst smells in, in nature. Some of the worst things you could ever smell are what we get when fats are fermented as opposed to sugars or even amino acids. Um, so Giardia is kind of famous for the greasy um, diarrhea that has a terrible odor. A lot of my former students work as nursing assistants um, and they were all familiar with it and they would know which room had a Giardia patient just walking down the hallway. Um, but notice it's not invasive, so there's no dysentery. There's no blood in the diarrhea typically. It should also be pointed out that some some people are long-term carriers of this. So anywhere there's poor sanitation, um, this can spread from person to person. Um, trichomoniasis is a sexually transmitted infection, so it's an STI, and it's um, more common than gonorrhea. We don't hear as much about it, um, partly because it, ha it it's it's more common in um, older older people than it is in college age people. Um, let's see. And in most cases, it's asymptomatic, but in, in others, it can lead to discharges and pain. Um, and it can last for years. So it's not invasive. It lives, um, in the urethra or in the vaginal lining. And because of that, a person can't really mount a good immune response against it, and a person can be reinfected many times. It mostly affects older people, whereas these two prefer college students and younger people. 
And any STI prevention, like barriers, can help prevent this. Um, but also we have some drugs that can treat it. And that's all I'm going to say about um, trichomoniasis. I will say a lot more about trypanosomiasis. So this is unrelated to trichomonas. Uh, trypanosoma is a, um, a genus of caninoplastids. So if you go back and look at your phylogeny, you'll find these. You don't have to memorize this. I don't care if you know that it's a caninoplastid or not. Um, but there are really three different diseases caused by members of this genus. Um, there's, yeah, two different versions of the human African sleeping sickness, um, an Eastern version and a Western version that really can be seen as separate diseases. Um, and these are transmitted by tsetse flies. So these are um, horribly, they're, they're horrible diseases that are often fatal, um, and they're the worst thing that can happen to a lot of people. Um, they're common. And that, that typically happens in Africa, where tsetse flies live. In the Americas, um, we have Chagas disease. Because in the Americas, this other uh, species from this genus can be transmitted by the, uh, the kissing bug. And yes, it is nightmare fuel. So this is what uh, trypanosomes look like. They're these weird shaped things that have uh, long flagella, and these are blood smears. This is an erythrocyte, and that's a lot of trypanosomes in somebody's bloodstream. That was a sick person. Um, if you find any trypanosomes in someone's bloodstream, that's very bad news for that person. Excuse me. This is a tsetse fly. Tsetse flies are big and they're weird and they give birth to live flies instead of eggs. Um, and some researchers I knew back when I was in Connecticut um, said that it is the most revolting sight a person can witness. So if you're the kind of person who Googles that sort of thing, have at it. I never will. Um, so let's look at the diseases caused by um, trypanosomes and spread by the tsetse fly. So initially, they're going to, uh, the trypanosomes are going to multiply in um, the deeper tissues under the skin and spread through the blood and lymph. Um, eventually, they're able to cross the blood-brain barrier and attack the brain, and that's what leads to um, loss of consciousness, aka sleeping, and eventually, um, eventually death. So the West African form, which is caused by um, Trypanosoma brucei, the Gambiense, features a slow progression from fevers and headache to brain damage and um, loss of brain functions and eventually loss of consciousness and death. And that can be a period from months to even years that a person can know that they are slowly getting worse and the end is coming. So that is horrible. The East African version moves faster, um, and it, yeah, it moves faster, and it can kill a person in, in weeks. There are treatments a person can get um, early on in the infection um, that will prevent uh, the trypanosomes from getting worse, and it will prevent the brain damage. So if you know you've been bitten by a tsetse fly, you can get these treatments if you have access to healthcare, where these would be available. Once um, the central nervous system infection happens, then the treatments you need are incredibly toxic treatments that cross the blood-brain barrier because they have to get where the trypanosomes are. And so those treatments um, themselves are potentially fatal. Uh, so that's kind of a horrible situation, and there's no uh, there's no vaccine. So prevention of the sleeping sicknesses is all about preventing bites from the tsetse fly. Um, so that happens in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that um, right here in this belt. Um, 
Chagas disease happens in um, South and Central America and to some extent the Southern US. Um, and let's see. What happens is these little bugs crawl on sleeping people. I mean, this is the like um, the narrative, so to speak, the most common case as we would envision it would be these bugs would crawl on a sleeping person and bite them on the face. Um, that's what they do for some reason and um, defecate. And if the person um, for some reason rubbed their face, some of the feces would get smeared into their blood um, and then they would have trypanosomes in their blood which is terrible um, and these trypanosomes will live in that person for decades there are asymptomatic latencies where the trypanosomes don't cause any damage um, and some people will go from that latency to autoimmune diseases where the immune system attacks the heart or the intestines in a terrible way so typically when a person gets these trypanosomes they have um, they'll have symptoms because the trypanosomes are in the blood and they're attacking the tissues and so there will be an immune response and a person will feel fever and sickness and swollen um, lymph nodes. Um, this can lead to um, meningoencephalitis which itself can be dangerous Um, and lasts for a certain amount of time and then there can be lifelong chronic infections without um, symptoms that's the intermediate phase at which point uh, there are no symptoms and it may be impossible to detect so it's difficult to test someone for Chagas disease um, some people get this chronic disease where um, for reasons we don't really understand they get these autoimmune attacks against their hearts um, and their colon and their esophagus. Um, there are drugs that can um, kill the, the trypanosomes during the acute stage of the infection but not during a chronic infection and it turns out that um, blood supplies in the US are screened for trypanosomes for these trypanosomes because there's no way for a person to really know whether they've been infected by this or not. The other thing is um, kissing bugs don't really go inside. They can't fly and the way to prevent this is to live in a house that is weather sealed like a typical house in the US. But if you live in a, in a tent or if you live in a house that isn't weather sealed, if you live in the tropics and there's no reason to seal your house, uh, these bugs can get in at night and that is terrible. So um, that's enough for right now. The next video we will get into the second group um, and the third group of uh, protist pathogens. Hopefully now you know what uh, trypanosomes are, and I'll see you at the next one.